Praise God. Hallelujah. I'll be reading from an extremely easy version. I've kind of adopted this version. Um, Luke chapter 6, verse 27. The Bible reads, but I say unto you who listen. Hmm, that's a message all by itself. <laughs> but I say unto you who listen, love your enemies. Do what is good to those that hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. I could close the Bible and go home right there. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. Uh, about 30 folks just walked out right there. And if anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you. And for, from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. That ought to deliver somebody right there. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? <laughs> Lord, I feel like preaching. Help me, Holy Ghost. Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do what is good and lend, expecting nothing in return then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high God. I'm going to continue reading. I got to go to verse uh, about 38, but I just wanted to pause right there because this, this is not in my notes. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high God. It qualified you to be a son or a daughter of God. <laughs> this is going to get ugly. Uh, for he is gracious to the ungrateful and the evil. For he is gracious to the ungrateful and the evil. For he is gracious to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given unto you. Now, I had to go read all this because we've been quoting this scripture, give, and it shall be given unto you. But there's some prerequisites to that. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure, here's the rest of it. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Before you take your seats. I want to use for a thought for a few minutes, and I promise you a few minutes. Uh, how's your credit? <laughs> how's your credit? How? We're still in the Next Level Living series, uh, but look at your neighbor real quick and ask him, how's your credit? Let him answer you. Please be seated. <laughs> uh, 
Those were some interesting conversations. I was waiting for somebody to pull out the Experian app. <laughs> and show them your FICO score. So let me talk about that piece for just a second. And I'll move to scriptural understanding. But first of all, we recognize that in today's society, there is a money system that is kind of based upon a few things. Uh, the Dow Jones, the stock market, a few factors contribute to how our money is handled and how it's valued. Uh, there was a, a meeting. Can I can I just talk to y'all for a minute? I, I promise I'm going to preach and get you all excited. I promise. Just give me a minute. Uh, there was a meeting on an island with some of the richest people in the world. Uh, the Rockefellers were there. Uh, some of the Kennedys were there. It's an unrecorded meeting. You'll never hear about it in the history books. But out of this meeting is where the Federal Reserve actually came from. Uh, many of people think that the Federal Reserve is owned by the federal government, but it's not. The Federal Reserve is owned by the top 2% of America, uh, the richest of the richest. Interesting thing, the Federal Reserve is down the street from the White House. It's not necessarily in that district, but it portrays the image that it's part of the government. Well, truth be told, it's not necessarily part of the government. It is the government. And even though we have a system of government and democracy, uh, it's so flawed and faulty uh, that we really don't have any trust in it. And so you can even take note from our election, uh, not that I'm for or against either candidate. If you want to have that conversation, we can have it later. Uh, but Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but she lost the electoral college vote. And for years, they have been trying to get rid of the electoral college so that the popular vote of the people would actually have a voice. And what happens is that electoral vote is supposed to be a representation of the people by those who represent us. But when it gets to the electoral vote, they do what they want to do. And so you really don't have a government that represents the people. You really don't have a money system that's in favor of the people. The top 2% of America want to keep what we call the middle class right below the poverty line. Because middle class is not necessarily middle class. Middle class is really poverty when you do the numbers. And we struggle to do things like buy houses and buy cars. And it's all based upon a score, uh, based upon what they call our credibility. Now, just because you have a negative credit score does not make you a bad person. But in today's society, before they even hire you, they run your credit. Y'all got to see where I'm going here. And based upon your money and how you handle your money, they're trying to say that's what kind of person you are. But you don't get a chance to explain to them that my FICO score ain't jacked up because I'm a bad person. My FICO score is jacked up because my mama put credit in my name before I could even grow up. Y'all ain't clapping now. Y'all ain't clapping now. My credit is jacked up because I tried to help individuals, you know, other folks that couldn't get stuff. I had to co-sign for them, and y'all ain't clapping now. 
It got messed up for several reasons. It got messed up because the banks decided that they wanted to give loans to people that couldn't qualify for the loans. And so people ended up in foreclosure, in bankruptcy. The market crashed. Folks was running out of here. Businesses was packing up and leaving. And money was getting scarce. And so individuals had to start doing things that they didn't want to. They start applying for credit cards that they knew they couldn't pay for. And why would they give you a $10,000 limit when you only make $15,000 a year? The system is set up for you to fail. It's set up for you to fail. And we don't realize that the top 2% of America uh, holds our money, and our money is not necessarily the thing that you have in your pocket. That piece of paper has no real value. It is a promissory note. I dare you. I challenge you. Get a bill out real quick and just look at it. It says promissory note. Why does it say promissory note? Because there's no real value in the thing that you have. But what it does is it gives you the opportunity to barter with that note on a promise that it will be paid. Money is only value is backed up right now by gold. You ain't carrying gold blocks in your pocket. But we're in a system and we're not even really holding the money. When you get a loan for a house, you don't see those dollars. They go into an escrow account electronically, supposedly. Are y'all with me? And then, then you get a bill. Do, do you understand what's happening here? You never really saw it. But that money now, because you bought a house, is secured in the real estate. But don't make the payment. And then they come and they take stuff from you that you don't really own in the first place. Oh, I, I, I wish y'all was in here. And so what happens is we get stuck in this system of money and, and we feel that we can't do nothing because our credit is all jacked up. I came to tell you this morning that you're in the wrong system. I know y'all want me to holler. I, I'm going to holler in a minute because I understand it. You might not holler, but I'm sure going to holler. Hallelujah. I'm going to holler in a minute. Uh, you're in the wrong system. Your trust is in the wrong system. And we've been placing our money in the wrong system. What would happen? What would happen if we just start forgiving people and started fresh? See, because really, in order to get into this system, you have to forgive first. If you look at a lot of the parables that Jesus dealt with when he was dealing with money, Jesus always would talk about uh, the individuals who had the talents, right? They had the talents or the money that the, that the man gave them when he was getting ready to go out of town. Y'all remember that story? He gave one, one, some more, and some more. And the individual that had the most took that money and diversified it. He invested it. Then you had the one that only had one. He buried it. He buried it. And when the master got back, the master was upset with him because he didn't try to take it and do nothing with it. He just buried it. So when he came back, that's where most people stay. They want to hold on to something that they have and try to try to believe that, you know, I'm going to just hold on to this and it's going to be all good. And they don't want to take no chance. And so when you don't take chance, there's no faith. I just kind of want to make it simple. When you don't take chance and you don't step out on biblical principle, there's no faith. And when you have no faith, then God has nothing to work with. You got to throw something out there for God to bless. We have all kinds of ambitions. We have all kinds of dreams. We have all kinds of plans. But when do you step out and start believing? Can I tell you that the first place to step out on faith is to believe God that if I forgive my enemies, that God is going to heal my emotions? 
I know you don't think this is connected to your money, but I promise you it is. I knew it wasn't going to get a whole lot of hand claps on this message, and it's cool. Hallelujah. That the beginning stages of your prosperity and your receiving the blessings of the Lord has all to do with the ability to be able to forgive and to let go. I know how to mash my own potatoes here. Uh, and so when we understand that, yes, individuals have done things to us and individuals may be even indebted to us. But at some point in your life, you're going to have to let this stuff go. The real question is, do you really want to go where you envision or where you talk about? Because if you really want to go there, there are some steps that you need to take to be able to go there. And I know you thought going to see old boy at Myrtle Lynch was going to help you reach your financial goals. But what Myrtle Lynch ain't going to tell you is you could bring them a few nickels and they'll do something with it, but it ain't going to go too far until you do what God is requiring of you and release and for I don't want you to talk to your neighbor I want you to talk to yourself and say who I really need to forgive some people I, I I really need to let some stuff I I feel some tension in this room and I like it hallelujah we need to get to the place that we forgive and we let go now what is biblical forgiveness now let's talk about that for a minute uh, biblical forgiveness, uh, let me say my holler, uh, biblical forgiveness has to do with the way God forgives. <laughs> Which is a difficult forgiveness. I'm not going to front and say it's, it's, it's easy. It's very difficult because, because when you're dealing with biblical forgiveness, this is something that you have to work on every day. Because you might have been moved in your emotions yesterday and you forgive, but today is a new day. And, and watch this. It's hard to forgive people when they keep doing the same thing. It's difficult. It's difficult. And then we get into the mindset to say, why should I forgive when you keep doing what you're doing? But when we deal with biblical forgiveness, when God says, I take your sins and throw them to the sea of forgiveness to remember them no more, that means when you came back doing the same thing that you had always been doing, but God had forgiven you, and then you came back and you said, God, please forgive me, and God says, okay, it's your first time, I forgive you. Y'all y'all missed that whole thing right there. Because he takes your sins and throws them into the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more. That means when you came back with the same sin, because God is God. And if he said he forgot it, then it's gone. When he came back, he didn't remember the sin that you did the first time because it's in the sea of forgetfulness. He, he doesn't even remember because he's God. This is an amazing God with amazing forgiveness. And I know some of you are going to grab to your humanity right now and say, I'm not God. I'm going to remember. But I thought we were trying to be like God. I thought the objective was to become a Christian. I thought the objective was to become more like Christ. Well, that's Jesus. That ain't God. Let me help you with the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Let, let me help you that there are three but one. Let me help you. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I'm just talking Bible here. We're just having a conversation. And so if God can forgive to the level of forget, if God can forgive to the level of forget and we're trying to be like Christ, it sounds like we have some mental work to do. We want to be so doggone spiritual, but can we deal with the mental capacity of where we are? Because this is the thing that is hindering us. It'll jack up your health. It'll mess with your mind. It'll jack up friendships. It'll have you all over the place. When am I going to get to the place? That I can forgive so that I can step into prosperity. Because my prosperity goes beyond my money. 
because it don't make no sense to have no money and I'm not healthy enough to really enjoy it. That I don't have a solid mental perspective of what God wants me to do with it. So, so I only give to those who are in my inner circle. Individuals that I can trust. I'm just dealing with the text here. Uh, because, because the Bible says, how is my credit when I do that? Because I'm only loving those that love me. So how's my credit? How's my credit? Oh, y'all not going to give me a cool FICO score, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to walk in the text here. And, and so if I only lend to those that, that I expect something back from, then how's my credit? How, how am I really working? I'm not expanding on anything. I'm just within the confines of my own trust, not believing God, not acting like God, not dealing with God, just doing what I do. Ask your neighbor, how's your credit? <laughs> Yeah, ask him again, how's your credit? Yeah, because now we're not dealing with the FICO score. We're dealing with your ability to be able to forgive. We're, we're dealing with your, your ability to be able to really forget about what your enemies did for you. Forget, 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 forget. You know, oh, God. And so how, 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 let, let me move. Y'all sit down. Y'all get me all excited. Uh, how, how, how do we deal uh, with this text uh, that, that, that tells us that our credibility is really low when we can only do to those uh, that do for us. The Bible declares even sinners love those that love them. Uh, a sinner was created uh, still in the image of God. It was Adam that slipped away. They still have the same uh, moral intuitions built into them. There's no difference. The only difference is, is that we've accepted Jesus, which sometimes makes it worse because we accept Jesus, but we still act like them. How, how, how can we be the representative of Christ and we don't act like Christ? And, and then we come with this foolishness. Well, the Lord ain't dealt with me in that area yet. Well, the Lord is not going to deal with you in that area. The Lord wants you to deal with yourself in that area. The Lord wants you to show some initiative that you really want to receive the blessings that he has for you. And how can he trust you if he's got to do all the work? Faith without works is dead being alone. There's some work that you're going to have to do, and it's going to be uncomfortable. There's nothing comfortable about forgiving people that are still trying to do you in. There's nothing comfortable about forgiving people that are at your throat at every opportunity. There, there's something uncomfortable about individuals that are out to get you, and you still got to forgive them. That's not comfortable, but God wants to see who he could trust. This separates who's blessed and who's not blessed. Because if God can trust you to forgive an individual who's at your throat right now, he says, now my child is ready to step into a place of prosperity that everybody else can't handle. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Ask your neighbor, do you have the power to forgive? Do if we would learn the power to forgive, nobody would be broke. If we would learn the power to forgive, no lack would be in the house. If we would learn the power to forgive. I feel something here. And so what's happening now is we've got to really begin to examine ourselves and take a self-assessment of our credit. We need to go through a spiritual credit repair program. Yes, Hallelujah. And not where somebody's going to do the work for you. Because that's where credit repair individuals make their money. They make their money because we're too lazy to do it ourselves. You ain't got to clap. It's cool. I know what credit repair is all about. You got to pull that credit report, and then you got to write all these letters and challenge all this stuff so it'll fall off your credit in 30 days. I don't have time for that. I got to go to work. Well, you had time to jack it up. This ought to be your investment in yourself 
to be able to take the time to do whatever's necessary to fix it. But that's the problem. We really don't want to fix it. We want somebody else to fix it. And now we're developing a generation of lazy spiritual people that don't want to work on themselves, that, that take offense to everything, that want to put the responsibility on somebody else. No, we need to take responsibility for ourselves and just begin to fix it and don't worry about what everybody else is doing because at the end of the day, they're not going to run the credit of the individual that's trying to get at you. They're going to run your credit. And then you're going to have to write a letter of explanation. I tried to help little Pookie get a car. And they would say, why? You knew what Pookie was going to do. Pookie wasn't going to pay no note. Pookie was selling drugs. You don't know. The drug market is worse than the real estate market. It's going to go up and down. You don't know when you're going to get robbed. Y'all acting real bougie in here this morning. You don't know if you got some bunk dope, too much baking soda. Y'all not talking back to me in here. Some of y'all acting real funny, and you know what I'm talking about. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. But there's a sure thing that if I live according to the principles of the Bible and I do what God tells me to do and I do it in the right spirit, God has already said what he's going to do. There's an expected end when I do right. <laughs> I don't have to guess. Even in faith, I don't have to guess because there's an expected end. How do we fight? How do we fight? We fight the enemy, first of all, and we realize that we're not each other's enemies. That's why God wants us to forgive, because that's not the real enemy in the first place. There's only one enemy. His name is the devil. But when you act like the devil, you become part of his army. Ask your neighbor, does the devil use you? Oh, no, come on, we having family conversation here. Ask your neighbor, does the devil use you? I got to be honest, I've allowed the devil to use me. I wish I could get some real people in here. I have allowed the devil to use me. I have allowed the devil to abuse me, and I participated. Y'all ain't being real in here. But there came a time in my life where I realized that the devil was working me up one side and down the other. And I had to get away from him. That his works only appeal to my emotions and my flesh to get me to step outside the will of God. And now that I want to serve God, I've got to fight my flesh. I've got to fight my emotions. I've got to fight the devil. I've got to fight folks that act like the devil. I've got a whole lot of fighting to do. And the only way I can fight is to fight spiritually. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. The blood of Jesus be against you. I want to move to a place where even when individuals are talking and doing stupid stuff, that I can hear it, read it, whatever, and I can move on because I know the hand of God is on my life. And then even bless you. <laughs> God should have never let me read the scripture, you know, that, that talked about those that don't like you, that you ought to love on them. And then the Bible went on to say that it reaped hot coals on them. <laughs> I don't have negative intentions, but what I want is the conviction of the Holy Ghost, those hot coals, the conviction of the Holy Ghost to come up on them so that they can meet the same man that I met and have their life changed. You got to check your intentions, check your heart. God wants to move you from where you are. And, and I thought, I thought it was just, you got to be a good steward of your money. Yeah, but you got to be a good steward of your emotions. Y'all, y'all, 
You got to be a good steward of your emotions. You got to check how you feel. Thank you, Dr. Mike. You got to check how you feel. You got to check it at the door. You got to make sure your intentions and your motives are on point before you start doing stuff or, or you're going to have problems. And God can't trust some of us. He, he know what we're going to do because he's trying to work with us and through us to a place of deliverance so that we can come out of where we are and really begin to experience the blessings of the Lord. What well, does the Bible say that the blessings of the Lord make it rich and add it no sorrow? I believe that, Brother Trent, from a literal standpoint, the blessings of the Lord make it rich. I just want to stop right there for a minute. The blessings of the Lord make it rich. The blessings of the Lord make it rich. That, that means that God does not want me in lack or in want. And, and see, many of you didn't clap right now. It's because, you know, you, you have issues with preachers that talk about money and all that. I ain't asked you for a dime. I'm trying to get you to the place where you don't have to ask me for a dime. Hallelujah. I don't mind paying a smud bill here and there, but I'm not going to pay it every 90 days because you won't get your emotions intact. I won't. I'm not doing that. You got to understand. I'd rather teach you how to pay your own bill. And it's not just going to work. You got to go to work with the right spirit. You got to go to work with the right attitude so that they will promote you. They not promote nobody mean. They not promote nobody swirling. They not promote nobody whose motions are all over the place, can't say nothing to you, scared to talk to you. They walk around your desk like they on eggshells. It's because you don't carry the characteristics of the Lord. Oh, I'm in trouble. Lord, bless me. I will when you get all this under control. When you get your life, I'll bless you. When you pull it back in, I'll, you can't even fix your face and you want God to bless you. <laughs> uh, and that's why I make comments like, if you don't want your haters, send them to me. Uh, because I believe haters are elevators. They help you go up, but the only way they help you go up is they challenge you in areas that won't nobody else say nothing about. <laughs> you know, hate, haters, haters, one of the reasons why they're haters is just because they're bold. You know, they say stuff that everybody else is thinking. And they might not necessarily be a hater. They might just really genuinely be pointing out a character flaw in your life. But because you didn't like what they said, now they're a hater. <laughs> they, just, they just hating on me. They ain't hating too wrong. They ain't hating too wrong. Hallelujah. And I'm not saying all haters are right, but sometimes they do challenge us in areas that we need to take a look at. I remember somebody telling me, Pastor, we, we don't know if you mean or not because your face, you know. And so I had to go get my life and fix my face. I used to have the excuse, I'm deep. I think a lot. <laughs> well, apparently I was thinking about the wrong stuff that had my face like that. So I had to go think about some different stuff and I had to make a conscious effort to fix my face I didn't say nothing like oh this is just me that's the problem it's just you it's not you and Jesus it's just you and just you need to be just fixed because when it was just me I needed just Jesus we gonna just get it right And now I'm in a place to understand that if I really want to progress and to push forward in this next level living, that there are some things that I can't take to the next level. And one of those things is unforgiveness. Yeah. Unforgiveness is not permitted on the level that God is trying to take me to. And it's difficult. And I wonder why things kept popping up. 
people that, that you know, I just, ooh, Father, help me. I, it, it kept popping up. And, you know, when, when it pops up, it keep popping up for a reason. Yeah. It pops up because my feelings about it didn't change even though my mouth said it did. The hairs on the back of my neck shouldn't stand up when I hear somebody's name. I shouldn't automatically get an attitude when I hear somebody's name. That means that I still got some pre-programming going on in my head and that my mind has already been made up about this individual and there's no change in me. And I need to address that. I need to get that. I need to deal with that. I, I need to work that out so that when I hear an individual's name, it's really all good. And I'm not trying to hold my face so my cheek won't jump. <laughs> oh, Y'all know about that one, huh? You want to smile, but because your emotions are battling, your nerves is telling on you. <laughs> your cheek jumps. I watched that show, Lied to Me, with the facial expression. Y'all ain't ready. Y'all ain't ready. Hallelujah. It's like, oh, you just lied. You just lied. And so when we look at the text here, let, let me land this sermon. Uh, when we look at the text, but love your enemies. Do what is good. And lend. Expecting nothing in return. I... I have a policy and it blesses my life that a lot of times individuals they need something and instead of me trying to figure out you know when I'm gonna get this back or whatever the case may be uh, I don't lend it unless I could give it now that's not saying I want you to pay me back But sometimes we lend and we can't afford it. And then what happens is we went out on a limb to help somebody else. And now emotionally it jacks you up. Because you lend it, but now they don't have no consideration for your situation. That was the problem right there. You shouldn't have lent because you weren't really in a position to lend it to them in the first place. Yeah, it's cool. My check is coming. No, you out of whack. Because if you're lending with the expectation of your check coming, you, you've already stepped out of a realm that you know you really can't handle. That wasn't wisdom. And so now the relationship gets jacked up. Because you're expecting them to pay it back and then something else happens in their life and they can't pay it back. And now you all messed up and now your credit has taken a few points because you wanted to help somebody and your intention was good. But, but the way in which you looked at how your money was, was off. Because we have been conditioned because of the system that we live in to live from check to check. Think about what I'm saying. We have been conditioned to live from check to check. So what happens if you don't receive two checks? Most of us would be homeless. Because that's how we're conditioned. Now, if some of us were, were in a different category, we would have six months of bills put away. What does that do? That frees your spirit. That if God say, this ain't the job for you, I need you to walk off today. Cool. And I don't have to stay under Saul because I prepared myself to advance. God, God, you're missing it. You're missing it. So what am I saying? Advancement takes preparation. I'm almost through here. Advancement takes preparation. You've got to prepare to advance. Advance is not something that one day you just wake up and God has moved you to the next level. No, advancement takes preparation. Preparation financially, preparation emotionally, preparation mentally to be able to withstand the wiles of the devil as they come at you as you advance. 
now. Advancement breeds contentment. Individuals don't like to see you advance, and it breeds jealousy because that's the thing that they want, and you got it, and they don't feel that you should have got it before them or they deserve it more than, come on, I know I'm talking to your emotions right now. Uh, I've been faithful. I can't understand. You know, we have all kind of things. But when God is ready for you to have it, you'll get it. <laughs> Y'all not going to watch this one twice. Huh? <laughs> when God is ready for you to have it, you will get it. But there's some prerequisites. Love your enemies. Do what is good and lend. Expect nothing in return. Then the Bible says, then your reward will be great. It, it'll be great. And you will be children of the most high God. Look at what's happening here. God is saying that not only will it be great, but the characteristics that you will hold will be that of a child of God. Do people call you a child of God? I'm just interested. What is that saying? They call me everything but a child of God. Do people call you a child of God? Are you recognized as one that represents the kingdom? No, I'm really asking you to check your life here. Are you one that represents the kingdom and represents well? When people see you, do they say that's a daughter of Zion or do they have some other stuff to say? They could talk about all the neg negativity, but somewhere along there in the line said, yeah, they this, that, and the other, because they want to discredit you. You'll catch that later. Uh, but at the end of the discrediting, but you know they in church now. And try to demean and belittle the change because they, they really want to illuminate the foolishness. <laughs> Thank God people don't have anything to do with my credit rating in God. Thank God. Because I really believe the text that promotion comes from the Lord. And, and I've experienced it. You don't know how it is to be in a room of people that can't understand why you're there. Have every reason why you shouldn't be there. It is the most awesomest thing in the world. When your emotions have been healed. See, God, God healed me, then he took me in the room. And I sat in the room and it was Comedy Central. I mean, they all was at the table. Bernie Mac, Richard Pryor, I mean, they all was there. It was Comedy Central. That's what I named them. Because they kept telling jokes. Jokes like, he's too young. <laughs> Maybe so, but I was here. <laughs> he didn't grow up in church. Nope, sure didn't. But I was here. The prerequisite had nothing to do with growing up in church. The prerequisite had to do with forgiving those folks at the table. Oh, God. Y'all going to catch this later. Because the Lord, our priest had already said that he would prepare a table. Some of y'all miss your table because you're looking for something else when God already prepared the table and had you pull up in front of him and he blessed you in the midst of it. I'm sitting there and God said, this is your table. And I didn't know he was talking about it. I said, I own this table. Man, what are you talking about? And then I got it. He said, thou prepared the table for you in the presence of your... I said, oh, it's all good. He said, now govern yourself, watch your emotions, watch your intent, don't get cocky. I brought you to the table, and I bring you down. Remember the rest of the scriptures, he that exalts himself shall be humble. You need to remain humble, because I got you here. 
check your emotions because just as a minute as you got there is as quick as he could take you out. And I governed my emotions. I said, okay, Lord. <laughs> okay, all right. You know me. Hallelujah. So you know what I need right now. I need you. Guide my words. Guide my mouth. Man, I'm calling every scripture out, out of the woodworks here. You, you don't have to know what you're going to say because the Holy Ghost is going to say it for you. And so, God, don't let me speak in the flesh. And I had to pause and listen to God. But I had, watch this, I had never done that in this kind of moment before. I would always try to prepare what I was going to say when really I needed to take Check the temperature of the tone in the room. Because when you're writing, you're not preparing for that. And now that I'm in the room, I'm checking the temperature and I'm listening to God. And God says, say this in response to what he just said. I said, ooh, that's going to make me look soft. And God said, listen to what I'm telling you and watch the result. So I said it and I saw the result. I said, ooh, that's interesting. God, you bad. How you, how you just tame that, that spirit just like that? See, a soft answer. Turn it the way, Rev. I'm, I'm, I'm learning how to work the Bible in my everyday life. And God is saying, when you work the text, the text will work for you. Woo! So I'm, I'm learning now here in real time at the table with individuals that can't stand the ground that I walk on. And God is giving me the words to say. And I'm walking right through this. And, and it's interesting because even at a table of enemies, God will give you allies. One by one, things start to turn. And to change and how I walked in with a certain amount of enemies and walked out with a certain amount of allies. God has the ability to turn it around, but you got to participate. <laughs> so in my conclusion, for real, how many times I said that? Twice? This is, my, this is my third one. I, I guess I really closed then. I'm a three closed preacher. Are you sure? I think you gypped me one. I forgive you. <laughs> Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Somebody say God mercy. We got God forgiveness. Now we got God mercy. God forgiveness. God kind of mercy. Do not judge. And you will not be judged. That's Bible. Don't do it. Won't happen to you. Do not condemn. And you will not be condemned. Don't condemn folks. Don't condemn them. Don't condemn them. That's why the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God didn't condemn us. He gave us a way out. Do you do that? Do you give people ways out? <laughs> or do you seal their faith before you even have a conversation with them? Forgive and it will be forgiven. Now, I, I could preach a whole message right there because as much dirt as I've done in my life, I need a whole lot of forgiveness. Maybe I'm talking to myself. Maybe I'm talking to myself. Could you imagine if God wouldn't forgive you for all the sneaky conniving stuff that y'all ain't talking back to me that you've done in your life? You'd be a hot mess. You go to hotmess.com and you would just start seeing all of our faces because God, y'all ain't, y'all better clap, say something. I'm going to stay here for a while. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus and real forgiveness that he really forgets about it once he forgives. That is amazing. 
amazing because he's doing something that we have a challenge in doing. And that's once we get forgiveness for us to forget about it, let it not have any more control over us. Jesus forgives us, but then we give it back power. That's my struggle. No, that ain't your struggle. The ba- I, I, what about all the songs we sing? The battle's not yours, it's the Lord's. Then why are you battling it? Oh, that's a whole nugget, whole nother message. If, it's, if, if the battle is the Lord's, then why are we fighting it? And because it's, it's my flesh, right? But just do the things that he tell you and he'll fight for you. Brother Terrell said he had to go on three day fast, three day fast with only water. I feel like fainting. <laughs> I'm a foodie. Hallelujah. It's for real when the Lord tell me to fast. Uh, Pastor, I need you to fast. Father, is there any other way? Let this bitter cup pass from me. And then he says, these kind only come out by prayer and fasting. And after I get through fainting, I'm going to be obedient because I got to work with God. (laughs) I got to work with God to be able to get to the next place. Shake your neighbor and say, either you're going to work with God or God is going to work on you. Either you're going to work with God or God is going to work on you. Either you're going to get with the program or he's going to program you. Either you're going to work with him or he's going to work you over. But one way or another, God is going to get you to the place that he wants you to be. Give and it shall be given. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together and running over. Why? Why is this so important to me? It's because, you know, I'm one of them individuals that I try to get everything in one trash bag. I mean everything, Brother Scott. You know, when they say the trash bag stretch, I believe it. So I open the bag up. We getting ready to go home. I open the bag up. And I start stuffing. And I stuff and stuff. Look at my motion. I'm pressing down. I stuff. Then I grab the bag and I shake it. Then I stuff. And then I buy the bags with the tassels because. I normally stuff it where you can't tie it together. But normally what happens is I stuff it so much that stuff start running over. This is how God wants to bless your life. I thought somebody would catch that right there. He wants so much stuff in your life that he's got to press it down. He's got to stop. He's got to shake it. And after he shakes it, he presses it down some more. And then stuff start running over. It's not that God don't want to bless you. It's that you don't want to participate in the process of being able to handle it once he gives it to you. Get your mind right. We're standing. That's all the holler I got. I got to tell you, my head feel a little better, too. Hallelujah. It's not throbbing like it was. Praise the name of Jesus. God is a healer. Come on, lift your hands all over this building. Come on. Lift your hands. God, we want to be blessed. We want to go to the next level. But God, in order to do it, forgiveness, real forgiveness has to take place to release and to let go. God, you're not the author of confusion. 
You're not the originator of foolishness. But God, you are the author of healing. You are the author of deliverance. You are the author of having the ability to be able to let go. So this afternoon, God, with our hands lifted, we want next level living, but God, we realize that our emotions and everything have to be intact. We have to learn how to deal with those that don't like us. We have to learn to deal with those that just talk bad about us. Have to learn to forgive even those that lie on us. God, we desire, we desire a closer relationship with you. And these things are a hindrance. So with our hands lifted, God, we ask you for the power to forgive right now. We want to forgive like you forgive. We want to forgive and not be affected by it anymore. We want to forgive and let go. And even though we don't have a full mind like you do, God, God, you can give us the power that when it arises, that whatever's in the past, we don't even allow it to affect us. That our emotions won't be stirred by people and their past relationships with us. Out of your own mouth today, if that's you, you really want to learn to forgive. The first thing I just need you to say is just say, Lord, forgive me for unforgiveness. Forgive me for unfaithfulness to your word. The Bible is clear. You want me to love my enemies, to bless those who hate me. So God, today, I take the first step. I'm asking you help me forgive like you do. I know the people I need to forgive. And I'm asking your help right now. Lord, I release them out of my heart, out of my mind. And as of today, I want no remnants of old emotions which have been controlling me and stopping my destiny. Today is the day of healing. I believe it, and I receive it in Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands and give him praise.